I love the TV series, The Men Who Built America. I've probably watched it way too many times. Set in the late 19th century into the early 20th century, this TV series follows the journey of entrepreneurs like Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Henry Ford, J.P. Morgan, and others. These entrepreneurs built businesses and developed innovations that transformed the United States of America and in so many ways, the rest of the world. I love this series not just because of these entrepreneurs, but because Nigeria, and in so many ways, the rest of Africa, is exactly where America was 150 years ago. And I don't mean that in a bad way. You see, 150 years ago, America was just beginning to urbanize and industrialize. The entire US population in 1870 was just a little over 38 million. That number has grown about nine times to over 300 million people today, and a lot of that population is clustered within cities. And these entrepreneurs played a critical role in laying the foundation for the America that we know today. I believe Africa is exactly at that point. 1.3 billion people. That's the amount of people who would live in cities across Africa over the next 30 years. That's a growth of almost a billion people compared to today's figures. Just to put that into perspective, imagine combining the population of all of Europe and that of America and adding that to Africa's existing urban population. That's the scale of growth that Africa is set to experience over the next 30 years. That's mind-boggling, right? I think so, too. You see, African cities are growing at over double the global average, while urbanization is slowing in other regions. By the end of this century, 13 of the top 20 mega cities in the world are going to be in Africa. And as you can see from these figures, those numbers are pretty high. These are just some figures for some cities in Africa, their population for 2,100. But this isn't even the best part. The best part is that two-thirds of our cities are yet to be built. And this growth isn't going to be clustered in one country. It's happening across the entire region. So if Africa is experiencing rapid transformation, or is going to experience rapid transformation over the coming decades. And truth be told, that transformation is already happening. Why then is the dominant narrative around Africa focused on insecurity, aid, and poverty? I think it's time for us to change that narrative and focus instead on this. Young entrepreneurs who are going to and are already building Africa's future. You see, um, I'm Nigerian, and being Nigerian is very exciting. <laughs> Except, of course, when you need to travel with a Nigerian passport. <laughs> that can make traveling very, very annoying. But anyone who's ever visited Lagos, the city that I've lived in the longest, will tell you that you can instantly feel the unique entrepreneurial spirit. There's this can-do attitude some call it also, that makes anyone who's ever visited Lagos instantly fall in love with the city. But this entrepreneurial spirit isn't restricted to Lagos or Nigeria alone. Every city and every country across the continent has what makes them unique. There's a saying that the ideal entrepreneur has the Nigerian also, the Ghanaian integrity, and the smoothness of a Kenyan. I've been privileged to visit cities in all of these countries and more, and I can tell you that this is true. Africa is bustling with so much entrepreneurial energy, and I believe annexing this energy is critical to the continent's future. As Africa's urban population continues to grow, young entrepreneurs are building tech and tech-enabled solutions to address everyday challenges that urban residents face. 
Going back to the analogy I painted earlier, these young entrepreneurs aren't necessarily stuck in the 19th century or early 20th century. They're leveraging the rise of the digital economy to build tech and tech-enabled solutions to various challenges. Take one of my favorite entrepreneurs, Temi Giwa Tsubosun, who's the founder, founder of LifeBank. LifeBank leverages technology to deliver blood and other critical medical supplies just in time to hospitals in communities and cities across Nigeria and Kenya. Access to these critical medical supplies can sometimes mean the difference between life and death. In just five years, they've saved over 10,000 lives and created several jobs. Or Luther, whose company, Price Pali, was one of the winners of the Lagos Urban Innovation Challenge that Utopia Lagos organized last year. They are redefining the food supply chain to enable urban residents shop at wholesale price, saving families up to 25% of their feeding budget. Now, in a country like Nigeria, where the food inflation rates are the highest they've been in recent years, these savings can be pretty significant. I can also talk about Faraja, whose company, Shule Direct, built the first e-learning, local e-learning platform in Tanzania. They've now supported over 2 million learners with digital learning content via mobile apps, SMS, and online portals. They are, meeting, they are meeting the need of critical access to educational learning content for young people, a need that was accelerated during lockdowns and school closures to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic or virus. Or Muhammadu, a Senegalese entrepreneur who built NIMA codes, which is short for my number is my address. With NIMA codes, locations without formal addressing can be mapped directly and linked to a phone number. I know everyone in this room knows what a postcode is and are familiar with the concept of postcodes. But formal addressing is still a major challenge across several parts of the continent. And that means several businesses struggle because their customers simply can't find them. But with NEMA codes, all a business owner needs to do is simply share their phone number and customers can easily locate them. I can go on with several more examples of countless entrepreneurs building tech solutions in mobility, energy, waste management, housing, and so on. But one thing is characteristic of young entrepreneurs across, across the continent. They aren't just building nice-to-have solutions. They are solving critical problems that are often as a result of critical gaps in infrastructures. As Africa's urban population continues to grow, these needs are going to become even more critical. The Andrew Carnegie's and the John D. Rockefeller's of 21st century Africa won't necessarily be steel magnets or control vast amounts of oil. They will very likely be building tech solutions to solve Africa's vast urban challenges. And this assertion is backed by data. A recent report by the IFC projects that the internet economy in Africa could contribute over 700 billion to Africa's economy by 2050. That's about 8.5% of the continent's GDP. So that's pretty significant. With so much potential, there are also significant hurdles to overcome to fully harness this potential. If you speak with any one of the entrepreneurs that I just spoke about, they will tell you that building in Africa is way harder than it needs to be. Truth be told, the infrastructure to fully support the growth of entrepreneurs like Temi, like Luther, and the countless number of other entrepreneurs who are building tech solutions doesn't quite exist yet. And this needs to change. In Kenya, for instance, research done by Endeavor a leading entrepreneur support network, suggests that only 5% of companies grow to become scale-ups. I'll offer some ideas on how we can begin to change this. 
many countries across the continent don't yet have legislation to support startups, starting with even a clear definition of what a startup is. Even worse, rather than trying to understand the needs of the young innovators behind these startups, policymakers sometimes respond or react with blanket, blanket bans that sometimes stifle growth. In Lagos, for instance, the ban on motorcycle alien startups have had a significant negative effect on the entire ecosystem. Realizing this challenge, countries like Tunisia and Senegal are taking a more proactive approach to try to solve this challenge. But more countries need to catch up. The Senegalese Startup Act makes it easy for startups to register and operate uh, in, in Senegal. It also guarantees incentives to investors and founders, but also creates a framework for entrepreneurs and policymakers to be able to collaborate. In countries like Kenya, regulators are adopting regulatory sandboxes. So rather than react to new innovation, they can now be observed in a much more controlled environment. And then working with these innovators, regulators can decide how they should be regulated. I think trends like this need to be accelerated. But beyond specific legislation like the Startup Act, I think policymakers also need to rethink their role to become a catalyst for entrepreneurial leadership on the continent. But this requires a mindset that sees these innovators not as a threat, but as Africa's biggest resource that can be harnessed for the continent's economic development. Just last weekend, I had my second dose of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. But what's interesting is the partnership that made it possible for these vaccines to be delivered quickly and at scale. A relatively unknown company, BioNTech, was able to partner with a much larger organization, Pfizer, a company that was founded in 1849. This partnership combined Pfizer's leadership in vaccine development and delivery with BioNTech's expertise in mRNA technology the technology that was used for the COVID-19 vaccine. This is just one example of a corporate startup partnership. They can take several other forms, but typically they combine the innovative nature of startups with the established scale and presence of some of these larger organizations. I think partnerships like this, combined with venture, corporate venture capital, can be very crucial to success of startups. This is especially true in Africa, where a lot of these young entrepreneurs have to work with very limited resources and in often harsh environments. No one understands what it takes to do business in Africa better than some of these large organizations that have existed for a while. And I think it's important for them to treat their investments in young startups as commercial partnerships, not as corporate social responsibilities, which is what, corporate social responsibility, which is what tends to happen. I think treating their relationship as commercial partnerships that can leverage their both, uh, that can be mutually beneficial and leverage both of their expertise, I think can be very significant and crucial. Last but not least, universities and research institutions across the continent can be very notorious for producing research that doesn't necessarily translate into commercially viable or scalable solutions. I'll be honest, like many of you in this room, I wanted to do research on issues that I care about and generate solutions that people can use. My only challenge is a lot of the research that happens in my country tends to end up in a shelf in a library somewhere. I think that can be very frustrating especially because I believe Africa needs more research-based solutions. Dedicated investments need to go into building research capacity, but also ensuring that the outputs of this research can get into the hands of organizations and decision makers who need to use them. Equally important, these investments should go into curriculum updates that help transform these universities into platforms for grooming technical and entrepreneurial talents.
So there you have it, one, a clear and coherent enabling policy environment for startups, two, more corporate startup partnerships, and three, investments in research capacity. With these three ideas, we can begin to support young entrepreneurs in a way that matches the scale of rapid transformation that the continent is bound to experience. Imagine with me for a second a world where Africa rising isn't just a narrative, but the reality indeed. A future where our continent is actually truly industrialized and one where the people experience true development. A future where we have a thriving middle class and urban poverty is eliminated across the entire continent. A future where our cities work, not just for the many, a future where our cities work for the many and not just the few. Africa's young entrepreneurs are going to build that future, but now is the time to give them all the support that they need. My hope is that in a few years, when a series is made about the women and men who built Africa, it would feature stories of entrepreneurs like Temi, like Luther, like Faraja, and Muhammadu. I can't wait to get to that future. Thank you.